Joining me now is David Stein, president and CEO of Koya Silver. Thanks for coming in. Good to see you. Thanks. My pleasure. You've got this uh, dual track strategy with the uh, Bethania project in Peru and then Silver Kings in Northern Ontario. Can you give us a, a brief overview of those two assets? Sure. Well, the dual track was originally just Bethania, and the, and the dual track really refers to the fact that we we have an advanced uh, project there, but that also has huge exploration upside. So the dual track is really that we can add value both by uh, restarting the mine, basically getting cash flows closer and closer to present day, NPV, and also by expanding the resources through exploration there. And we've got the opportunity to do both of those things there. I think over the you know medium to longer term, our plan is to do both at the same time and just create you know a lot more value than just doing exploration on its own. Now, then since we've been public uh, and more recently, we added on the second project in Northern Ontario, a little earlier stage, but it's uh, similar in the sense that we're targeting you know very high grade, uh, small tonnage kind of silver uh, vein operations. And with that, uh, the Silver Kings project, we've you know we've recently made a new discovery. So we've got an exploration track going there. We've got exploration at Bethania, and we've also got the production story as well. So it's almost uh, three tracks. Almost then. three Yeah, tracks. all right, yes. very good. Um, so you said that you're about six months away from restarting production at Bethania. Can you tell us, uh, work backwards and tell us what needs to be done before you get there? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, to be clear, it would be it would be six months from a go decision that we have not made yet. Okay. But the point is, is that this is because there's already a mine there, the infrastructure is already there. It is quick to restart. You know, regardless of what month that happens. And now, in terms of you know the the process though to get there, um, what we would like to do is so at this mine we have these high grade silver veins, but we also have some base metals with them. So we're going to be producing concentrate there. We'd like to get an off taker to buy our concentrate, you know, over a contract, which would then also provide us some additional financing. And you know, as as a mine that's been in production in the past with a known uh, concentrate product, we have a tremendous advantage, uh, a lot of interest for that. Now, uh, then we then what we would do is we would go and do some underground development. Um, we're you know, for a few months. And that would be a, a very short process, again, because the mine was in production, you know, uh, six or seven years ago at this point. Uh, so f still fairly recently. And then we could start pulling ore uh, at that point. And within, you know, a month or two, we would start, uh, we'd be in the position to start selling concentrate. All right, very good. Now, you've said that Bethania is low cost, high margin. What are some of the highlights of the economics of the project and, and maybe flesh out the potential for expansion as well? Sure. Um, so not only is it, you know, low cost, but it's also low capital intensity. And I think that's really important, especially in this day and age where financing is so difficult. Um, you know, it's great if you've got a project that can make $50 million a year, but if it costs you $500 million to build it, you know, you're paying it off over 10 years. You've got obviously the time value of money, all the risk of, you know, debt and dilution. So what we've got is a project that can pay back in about a year, plus or minus, depending on the silver price. Um, and that's if we build our own mill. And then if we actually uh, bridge that, which we're looking at doing and doing some toll milling first, then it's even much less than that. So, uh, so we've got a project that is, uh, you know, that is sort of bite-sized for our size of company and something that is actually doable. Now, it's all, now, in order to be low capital intensity, you also have to be low cost or high margin. And we have that. We've got, you know, these nice high-grade veins that also have the base metals in there as well uh, that, you know, add additional revenue for us. So when you look at that, you know, our costs should be in and around, you know, 10 to $12 all in sustaining costs per ounce of silver, maybe a bit more if we toll mill because there'll be some additional costs to that. But again, it depends also a lot on the grade uh, that we mine in any particular month or quarter. So it'll be low cost. Um, it'll be a quick payback project. And then getting to your, the second part of your question, which is the expansion potential, that really comes down to the exploration. So we've really just scratched the surface with our current resource. Um, we really just drilled around the mine workings. And with that, we got a nice, you know, uh, starter kind of resource there. Uh, seven years mine life in our PEA. We would then um, do more exploration, a long strike, deeper, 
We've got two other um, zones that we've discovered as well with veins on surface. So we've got lots of potential to grow the resource quite significantly. And that would then feed into a, a decision in the future to expand the mill. All right. And then shifting over to Silver Kings in Northern Ontario, uh, you've started some follow-up drilling. The main target is the Angus vein. Yep. So what have you done so far? What are you doing? What are you going to do? And what makes this project compelling? Wow. Uh, so many things. But uh -huh. uh, the um, so I'll, I'll tell you the story of the Angus vein. I mean, because we we did poke around a little bit. We've we've had properties in the camp for over two years now, but we've sort of been adding to it over the years. And we um, we went to an area that had some mineralization on surface, but not economic, just anomalous and drilled it at depth and we hit a brand new discovery. And I think it's the Angus vein discovery is very different in the sense that while there have been juniors poking around in the cobalt camp, you know, for the last three or 40 years, I still think it's vastly underexplored compared to other mining camps in Canada and the world. But, um, but, uh, but there have been a few here and there. And the strategy, including our own strategy previously, was to just follow up on old mine workings and see if you could extend it a little more where the old timers, you know, either didn't follow it up or ran out of money or whatever the case may be, went on to another property in some cases. So there's, there's lots of, and there still is opportunity for that. But what's really special about the Angus vein is it's a brand new discovery. There was no mining on that property ever. And it really, when we, dis when we discovered that, we hit our discovery hole uh, was 3.3 meters of 15, over 15,000 grams per ton silver. So that's 1.5% silver. Uh, one of the highest grade, you know, silver intercepts probably for several years in the world. Um, but when you actually look at that, uh, and although that's extraordinary, when you look at it relative to the production history of the cobalt camp in the early 1900s, that's actually what they were mining. They were mining multi-percent silver, small tonnages, but you don't need a lot of tonnage when the grade's that high. So uh, so I think we found something that is really what people have been looking for for a long time, and that's uh, really exciting to follow up on. So we're just, you know, starting an, a second drill program on that target now. All right, great stuff. Now, as far as the, the company itself, management owns about 15% of the stock. You've got Sprott in there as a shareholder, nine point. So what, what should the market know and investors know about management skin of the game and the, and the shareholder base and what that conveys to the market? Yeah. Yeah, and we should mention Crestcat as well. They're actually our biggest institutional okay. shareholder now. Yep. So, um, well, look, I think we've got, um, uh, you know, managements uh, are real investors in the in the company, uh, and a lot of that was me. Um, but uh, as well, some of our executives and directors have, have put in money as well. So um, I think we've got a really strong, you know, uh, ownership uh, structure there. Uh, and obviously, we've we've got some good support from some uh, shareholders, family offices, institutional shareholders, um, you know. But we're 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 still small. There's still a lot of room to grow there. There's just a lot of room on the boat. Uh, so we'll be working on that uh, going forward. All right. Now, uh, as far as silver itself, as you know, for a few years now, it's been in a range. Let's call it 22 to 27, roughly. Uh, so, what do you see as potential catalysts to to finally get it? moving meaningfully and to break 30 and actually, you know, really start to go? Well, first of all, um, in, just to put silver into context, I mean, it, 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 um, it really, when you look at it over many decades, it really follows gold price, at least in terms of the trend. So when the gold price goes up, usually the silver price goes up more on percentage terms. It's like a higher beta version of gold. Um, how, however, one thing to keep in mind with silver is it's actually an extremely small market. Um, so for those who follow metals, you would have seen that there was a big squeeze on nickel a few years ago. Right. And the silver market's actually smaller than the nickel market by dollar value. So if there was ever a lot of buying you know, at once into silver, you could see the price spike up quite dramatically. And that's something that, you know, you wouldn't, you won't probably see with gold or copper, which are huge, huge markets. With that being said, I think the catalysts are in, in the, in the short term are going to be, you know, a trend change in the, in the macroeconomic picture, um, uh, you know, which, uh, which we're sort of all, all waiting for. I think, um, you know, the silver price is not done that badly when you consider, you know, where it's been over the last 10, 10 years. Um, but, you know, I think uh, any 
any wobble in the in the sort of macroeconomic picture. Um, you know, like we saw with the banks, uh, the, with the Silicon Valley Bank, um, that caused a bit of a, a run into silver, short-lived. But uh, those types of things, if we go into something uh, bigger, then I think you'll see an even bigger move in silver. There's a really good graphic. You may have seen it from a Visual Capitalist, and it shows the uh, the size of um, each metals market, including precious metals. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, copper is big, and then right down there is silver in it. And it's just tied, to put it in perspective, Visually like, visually like that is really interesting. And of course, as you know, in our lifetime, maybe not your lifetime, but we saw silver have that big run in the late 70s, and then in, I guess it was 2010, 2011, and of course, everybody's waiting for the next one. Now, as far as um, your projects, Bethania, Silver Kings, you've said that they're both nicely situated on the, uh, the, the Lausanne curve, which is essentially the, the life of a, a miner, basically, especially starting with exploration. So uh, explain that, and also uh, uh, give us a a little wrap up 30 second investment case for Koya Silver. Sure. Well, I mean, the Lasan curve is something that I've been looking at, you know, in my previous, I've been in mining capital markets now for 20 plus years. And uh, it's something that, you know, I've seen over and over again since the 90s. And uh, I just decided to finally embrace it and look, look, you know, and, and, and honestly, where, where our two projects sit on the Lasan curve is really the perfect spot. You've got one project where you're just starting to delineate a new discovery, where it goes from being just kind of an interesting discovery hole to a real deposit. And that's where we are with Silver Kings. And then and then the other point on the Lasan curve where the most value is created is when you go into production. And again, we're potentially within months from doing that at Bethania. So um, so I think we it does work really well in our case. And you've got, you know, again, two projects that could be moving up in value at the same time, which is even better than if you only had one, which is most companies, let's face it, most companies. So, um, I mean, so my wrap-up kind of pitch for Kuya would be that, um, you know, we've just been through a, a really, really rough uh, bear market for, uh, you know, for the precious metals equities in general. And, uh, but despite that, we've been able to really build value in, Kuya, in Kuya. So. Not the share price, but the value of the underlying company has is massively more than it was a few years ago. We have really de-risked Bethania. We've got gotten our permits. We've gotten a resource, a PEA. Uh, we've uh, acquired more land uh, to basically show the market where the growth is going to be for the next five to ten years at Bethania. Uh, we've made we've acquired the properties at Silver Kings, hundred percent owned. We've made a new discovery there. So we've accomplished so much in a, such a terrible market. Uh, I think just imagine what we can do in a good market. Like it's, uh, I think it's going to be really exciting. All right. Thanks for coming in. Uh, fascinating information. We'll be watching. Thanks a lot for, oh. for talking to me. Absolutely. David Stein, president and CEO at Kuya Silver.